Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thanks to Andres for the fantastic uh, help yesterday to get everybody ready for this uh, lecture. And thank you all for coming here this morning as well. It's great to see you all here when you were expecting to see John Doherty and instead you get me. But anyway, that's just the way that it is sometimes. But I'd like to thank Roberto especially for the fantastic organization and for bringing us all here to this beautiful place. It's really uh, great to be here. Thank you very much. For that. I would also like to say that I love being in South America. It's just such a great continent. And one of the reasons it's so great is that everybody is the same height as me. You know, that's a really wonderful thing. When I'm in Europe, all these people, they're right up here. And, and now I come, well, it's like coming home. It's just really great to be here. Okay, what I'm going to try to do this morning is to tell you a little bit of a story about what I'm calling implementing the next generation of biocatalytic uh, processes. So it takes off a little bit from where Andres was talking yesterday and takes us a little bit to the next stage of development. It's different to what I'm going to talk about at Sinopharm, but there will be a little, few things which I, which I will cover which will be perhaps uh, similar. And perhaps worth me starting by explaining that I'm really a chemical engineer. Okay, for 25, 30 years I've worked with biological systems, but really I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. And my career began in industry, working in this kind of environment here. So on the process plot, I'm a real engineer that was working in the plant, actually trying to switch the valves, trying to make everything work correctly. And I'm a practical kind of person. I'm not necessarily an excellent scientist, but I would like to think that I'm a good engineer. When I began in the plot, almost on day one, I learned two very important lessons. The first lesson was, well, how this plant is quite big. Well, of course, as you know, I'm not such a tall person. So of course the plant looks very big. That's, you know, it's so different from working in the laboratory. That's a very important thing to remember. If we're going to implement and really run a process, we have to think about what scale and what size we're really talking about here. And then the second thing which I learned, which was very disappointing, and that is that chemical engineers are not normally involved in designing new plants. Normally they're involved in running the plant, supporting the plant, maybe retrofit, but they're not involved so much in designing new plants. And that was a quite an important lesson for me. But even in these early days of my career, I started to think about a question which I've been thinking about a lot over the past 20 years or so, and that is a little bit about what could the future of this kind of industry, this chemical industry, look like? So just think for one moment what perhaps the world could look like in, let's say, 10 or 15 years' time. Okay, if you're working in a chemical laboratory, what will that look like? We will use clean and sustainable reagents. We will have good atom efficiency, so in other words, all the carbon which goes into the reactants of the process will be there in the, in the product. We will have high selectivity in each step. We will use catalysis, that's heterogeneous catalysis, homogeneous catalysis, as well as biocatalysis. And we will be based probably on renewable feedstocks. That's where we're going to be in the laboratory. As I explained, I'm an engineer. So what would the process look like that goes with that? So where we might get to is that we have a process which uses all forms of catalytic synthesis, what I call here a hybrid process. That means we might have fermentation, we might have enzyme biocatalysis, we might have heterogeneous catalysis, we might have homogeneous catalysis, all within one process. We don't have that currently today. We will have integrated separations. This ISPR stands for in situ product removal, where we remove the product as we go along through the process. And this will give huge improvements to the intensity of the process. We will have other types of intensified operations. We will have a small amount of waste. We'll have few pH changes, temperature changes, or solvent changes. One of the huge problems with biocatalysis, trying to put it in the middle of a chemical synthesis, is that sometimes we have to change the pH, we have to change the medium, we have to change the temperature. So while what Andres says is completely correct, that we of course, have mild conditions for biocatalysis, they often don't match the rest of the chemical synthesis. And then we will have a fewer process steps as well. So this is where we will try to get to in 
15 years time. And of course, biocatalysis, as we've explained yesterday, can answer some, not all, but some of these problems. And let us just uh, recap for one minute about what we mean by biocatalysis. I'm talking about a process where we have the conversion of a compound A to another compound B. So it's a chemical synthetic step, and I use an enzyme, or maybe several enzymes, within, let's say, a cell to do that. Maybe I decide it's better for transport reasons to remove the enzyme from the cell, but still keep a lot of protein with it. So that's what I call here a crude enzyme. Now I convert A to B, I have my enzyme, but I also have a lot of other protein material with this as well. And that could be important to give stability to the enzyme, but it also uh, helps us a little bit in terms, of, uh, in terms of processing cost as well. So this kind of pure enzyme is very unusual to really operate with. And again, as was explained yesterday, often we will immobilize this enzyme by putting this enzyme on a solid support in order that we can recycle it. Glycatalysis comes with many advantages, and I certainly don't need to go through the list here, but just to say that this issue of selectivity is by far the most important of the issues here, and then this, today, this ability to alter the catalyst properties by swapping the amino acids enables us to protein engineer our enzyme so that it has exactly the properties that we want it to have. Opportunities for biocatalysis are growing. There is an enormous expansion in this area today, and that's because essentially biocatalysis is very good at working with multifunctional molecules which are sensitive. That, of course, is exactly the type of molecule we often see in a biorefinery. So just to put it in the context of Brazil, I think there could be fantastic opportunities here. So, for example, molecules which come from fermentation, where we often have a very complex mixture of different compounds, maybe this could also be an opportunity to put enzyme catalysis alongside the fermentation, a completely new way of looking at these kind of processes. So I've seen a couple of papers now start to, to go in that direction. Materials based on new building blocks. I come to this in a few moments, but for example, processes based on a completely new sugar refinery. Imagine we use glucose not now for biofuel, but we use it, or maybe to supplement the biofuel, by making other types of chemical, higher value chemical products. Uh, also glycerol, which of course can come from biodiesel. I will not talk about biodiesel today. Uh, in Sinopharm, I will talk much more about uh, enzymatic biodiesel, where we have the a process which is operating now at considerable scale. Integration within biorefineries is obvious, and integration into existing plants by a retrofit. I'm involved in a number of projects with companies where they want to expand their capacity. And the way they do that is they take new capacity now with an enzyme catalyzed process. That's one of the routes to try to get new technology into the process. There are, as was mentioned yesterday, some problems and challenges also with biocatalysis. So enzyme availability has been a challenge for quite some time. 15 minutes away from where I work is the world headquarters of Novozyme, the biggest enzyme company. And their business model, their business model is such that they have to operate a very big scale. They can only go into very large markets. That's the only way that they can get the return on all the investment which they needed to make uh, in order to develop uh, this enzyme. So that's a real challenge. If we want to come with a new enzyme, a specialist enzyme, to do particular chemistry, that's not so easy to be able to get to that. So this, is a, this is, has been quite an issue. There are many companies now, in Europe especially, which are focused on this much more specialist enzyme supply. So I do believe we're starting to address this issue. Substrate scope has also been a problem. Unless an enzyme is promiscuous enough, we don't have the possibility to be able to use it time and time again for lots of different types of reactions. If we take a chemical catalyst, they are very good at being able to do that. So that's also something which needs to be developed, and protein engineering is one of the solutions to that. Activity and stability under industrial conditions are very often limited. That's also quite a challenge. We have non-natural substrates, of course, which we're interested in converting. So, inevitably, they will not be particularly active. People often say, well, enzymes are fantastic catalysts. Yes, they are, on natural substrates, 
under natural conditions. But you move away from a natural substrate, or you move away from a natural condition, then of course we will have uh, a challenge. Thermodynamics is often a challenge as well for these types of reactions. It's fine if we work in water, 55 molar water, of course, when we do a hydrolysis reaction, everything is going in the right direction. But the moment that we need to think about other types of reactions, synthetic reactions, esterification, running now the reaction the other way around, that of course uh, becomes quite a challenge. Development of time and cost in the pharmaceutical industry, where many of these kinds of processes are implemented, they need to go very quickly. They need to get their products into the market very fast. Exactly the same as Mohammed also talked about yesterday. So this also needs to be addressed. And also, it's a multidisciplinary area. It needs people like me as a chemical engineer, but it also needs many people like you. It needs biologists, it needs organic chemists, all to try to work together. And perhaps it's a bit surprising that I can stand here today and say what a challenge that is. It was a challenge when I began my career, and it's still a challenge today how to get different disciplines to work together. And I encourage the, the, the younger people here, especially to really think about this. And listen to the other disciplines, try and learn from them, and try to work together with them, because that's really where the solutions are going to lie. So having chemists looking at catalyst selection, design, biotechnologists with enzyme technology, also chemical engineers with reactor and process design. Try to bring all these parts together is quite an important challenge that we have to try to address. Maybe in universities we don't actually teach people in the right way to be able to do that. We can have a discussion about that. Now from a practical point of view, let's just think about <clears throat> what we have to do to implement any type of biocatalytic process. The first thing to say is that if I have a chemical catalyst, the issue here is Okay, this, this, this catalyst can have very good space-time yield, the productivity can be very good, but it's limited in selectivity. And what is it that biocatalysis offers me? That offers me very good selectivity, but now at the expense of the productivity. So this desirable region up here is both a challenge for chemical catalysts, just as much as it's a challenge for biocatalysis. And it's not that the two are in competition, they should work together with each other. And if they work together with each other, then certainly from the biological side, what we need to do is to work out how to improve the productivity of the reaction. And to think about the productivity of the reaction, the first thing we have to think about is how much do things cost? What's the economics involved in a biocatalytic uh, process? And the first thing to say is that many people will tell you enzymes are very expensive. But let's just think about what that really is. When an enzyme costs something, of course, it's a certain number of dollars per, per kilogram, but the important issue here is a little bit, not just that cost, but how we're going to use this enzyme as well. So if we take a different type of market, for example, the farmer market, then this is the kind of cost we talk about, between $1,000 and $10,000 per kilogram. It's a small market, and therefore it needs to be sold at high cost. If I take a bigger market, let's talk about bulk chemicals, or even we could think perhaps about biofuels here. In this kind of a market, we of course it's a much bigger market, so we can sustain a much lower cost. We get the economies of scale here, maybe $250 per kilogram. It sounds a lot of money, but let's see now how we use that enzyme in the process. So what's important is how many dollars it costs per kilogram of product that I actually make. So if I take a pharmaceutical, the product per enzyme ratio needs to be somewhere between 50 and 1,000 kilograms per kilogram. That's a very important figure because that really sets as a target what we need to try to achieve here. Enzyme contributions then between one and say $200 per kilogram. For a bulk chemical, it's a different situation. We need about 5,000 kilograms per kilogram, then it's about five cents per kilo. That's the kind of value that we talk about. So these kind of target figures, how many kilograms of product we get per kilogram of enzyme is very important. This is for immobilized enzymes. Of course, if I have a liquid enzyme, if I have an enzyme in a cell, it's a different set of calculations that go with this. But both market size and the productivity are critical to this kind of 
calculation. Let's think a little bit more about the economics of the process. This is a typical kind of biocatalytic process, very simple way of looking at it. Okay, I have uh, a reactor here, maybe the pointer doesn't work, a reactor here, a separation in which I separate the biocatalyst, and of course, ideally, I need to recycle that so that I get sufficient productivity out of this. And then up here, I have another separation, uh, maybe here, sorry, this should be the uh, substrate here, we recycle back again here, and maybe we can produce some product out of this as well. It's what's important in this kind of process is to see what's the value of the substrate and what's the value of the product, and what's the conversion from substrate to product. And that conversion gives us the operating space for us then to be able to make an improvement to the productivity of, of, of the process. So a kind of simple algorithm might go something like this, that in the first place we need to define the added value of the reaction, that depends on the value of the substrate, the value of the product, and what the ratio is, the grams of product per gram of substrate that we can get out of the process. So, if the thermodynamics is very unfavorable, of course the gram of product per gram of substrate will be very low. And we need to uh, think about what to do about that. Maybe also we have a product here which doesn't have sufficient value relative to the substrate. In biofuels, it can even be a little bit like that. So we really have to think about how to be able to get sufficient value added from the reaction itself. That's an amazing number of reactions. You can look at in the literature, scientific literature, and you can see that just from this first step, there is no way they can ever make a process because we don't make enough money in the very first step. This doesn't mean, even here, if we make some money out of this, it doesn't mean that we have an economic process, but at least we have a chance of an economic process. So in the second step of this, then we can define what we call the operating, operating costs here, and this is to do with the grams of product, the gram of biocatalyst, this is to do with the biocatalyst cost, and the concentration of product going into the downstream process as well. Then we can define also the capital cost, so this is to do with the production rate, the gram per litre per hour, the space time yield, and this reflects something about the plant size as well. And then the final step is how do we get from our performance today to these targets which we set. So we set targets for the gram per gram, the gram per litre, the gram per litre per hour. These are the important set of targets here. And this defines the kind of intensification that will be required. Our options for intensifying the process, and I will talk much more about this at Cinefern. The options are to change the targets, so in other words, we could have a cheaper feedstock, we could have a better conversion. We could instead accept that we still have the same feedstock, we still have the same conversion, but maybe we can implement some intensification technology, and that will help us to meet the targets for the operating expenses. Or maybe instead we can retrofit the plant. Maybe we can move, for example, from batch to continuous plant. That's one of the things we have done with our uh, enzymatic biodiesel process, and I will talk a bit about that in uh, Cinefern, about how we have done that. So it depends a little bit on the market, but we can set some targets. Here I saw some targets for operating costs, for grams of product, per gram of a mobilized enzyme. These are the typical kind of values for farmer industry, fine chemicals, bulk chemicals. And here's the kind of concentrations that we require. This is a bit more shocking. So even for a pharmaceutical product, we talk about 100 grams per liter, bulk chemicals up to 400 grams per liter. But these kind of values are perfectly possible to achieve. The 6 amino penicillinic acid process, which Andre gave such an excellent example of yesterday, that is operating up here at about 12,000 grams per gram, I think, today. And if we look at the process also for making acrylamide from acrylonitrile, that's a process which operates about 450 grams per litre. So it's not that it's impossible to get to these values, but well, we clearly need to put some work in in order to be able to get there. One technique we might use to help us to get to that point is what we call in-situ product removal, where we remove the product as we go along through the reaction. So here I have my reaction. Conventionally, I have a downstream process here, but now instead I have a reaction and I remove the product and recycle everything else back again to the reactor. 
And this can help us not only with film dynamics, but more usually it can help us with product inhibition or product toxicity. And we can apply this to fermentations just as much as to enzyme catalyzed reactions as well. Uh, Eli Lilly, based in Indianapolis in the United States, they have a process which operates with a reactor here. They have biocatalyst recycle stream here so that they make good use of the biocatalyst. They have to feed the reactant to this. And then they have a kind of absorption column here where they absorb the product as they go along through the reaction. And then they recycle everything back again to the reactor. They have to make a small adjustment in the stream here before they come back into the reactor. This, when they implemented this kind of uh, process and I was discussing with them, they were able to make a whole order of magnitude improvement to the economics. So that's the kind of improvement which you can get in these sorts of, uh, in these sorts of processes. Well, that's one technique in situ product removal, but myself, a lot of other people as well, uh, have been working on different kinds of techniques to help us. So we have to liquid phase biocatalysis, where we introduce an organic solvent, which is immiscible with the aqueous phase, in order to be able to extract a product or supply a reactant. In situ product removal, immobilization, of course, is important. The use of an excess of a reactant can help to shift them dynamics. Uh, and then we also have, alongside this, biological changes. We could do protein engineering to be able to change the catalyst to be able to fit with what we require from the process. So a number of different techniques are available to us. We can also, as I've listed here, show some of the bottlenecks and problems that we have. Maybe the reactant in the product is unstable, perhaps thermodynamically unfavorable. Maybe we have a reactant in product with low water solubility, perhaps the reactant is toxic or the product is toxic. Now what's interesting about this table is the problem which arises, which is that we can see very easily in this table there are many solutions here. Process technologies just as much as biological type technologies as well. But for any given bottleneck, which one of those should I choose? What's the best route for me to go? What's the best place for me to put my money? This is a really important question in industry. Where should they put their money? to work out which one of these I should really address. And there's another problem here. I now have multiple bottlenecks here. Which bottleneck should I aim for? If I solve one bottleneck, okay, now I have another bottleneck to come after. At what point do I stop? If I improve one of these so much, perhaps actually it gets overrun by another one. So trying to understand our way and map our way through this, this intensification scheme is really an important objective, and for some years now we've tried to work on a kind of a scheme which will help us. When we look at a particular intensification technology, we do scale-down experiments, we use this to build a kind of process model, and this enables us to work out what's the benefit of implementing one of these intensification technologies. But there's another part to this which we have not really succeeded in yet, and the other part is to look at the cost of implementation. How much does it cost to implement one of these? When I discussed with the uh, Eli Lilly company in Indianapolis, one of their issues was how long it took them to be able to select the right kind of support and absorption matrix to be able to run this effectively. It doesn't happen just straight away. Likewise, if I talk to a company about protein engineering, how long does it take them to develop the assay, to do the screening, and so on as well? So we eventually we have to understand something about the cost of implementation as much as the, the process model and, and the benefit as well. But this eventually can help us to work out potential changes to the process and also potential changes to the biocatalyst. This is a way, a kind of a tool, of helping the protein engineers to understand what it is they really need to do to put the process in place. Okay, I'd like to give you now quickly four examples of the type of work which we do in order to illustrate some of these issues and to talk a little bit about how next generation processes uh, can go. And I'd like to begin by talking about biorefiners. I think it's a very important topic for South America in general and Brazil in particular. And uh, we have had a discussion with the Novozymes, who I work very closely with, about how we should really go into this field. I mean, a 
If you think about where we are today, we talk about taking an oil feedstock, an intermediate, through to a product. And eventually, we want to get from a new type of feedstock, new intermediates, in fact, even new products from this as well. Because if I try to implement this new kind of technology today, the problem is that all the cost of the plant is written off. That's very difficult then to be able to argue how do I implement a, a new process. So our idea was to go in stages with this. And in the first stage, we talk about coming from a new feedstock here, a renewable, to a new intermediate. We don't go as far yet as the final uh, product. And that's particularly important because we're comparing completely new technology where the costs are not optimized in any way, so that's this kind of bio-based chemistry here, compared with petroleum-based chemistry, when of course we are have a very, very sophisticated and advanced level of optimization. The example that we have chosen to work on together with Novozymes concerns the synthesis eventually of this Puran 2,5 dicarboxylic acid, you can see the structure of this molecule is very similar to terephthalic acid. And that means that we have the potential also to polymerize this and to be able to come with a completely new type of uh, plastic and a replacement for PET. That's a very huge market, and therefore we have to make a very large amount of this product, and therefore the costs have to be very low. So this we thought was a very good challenge to try to enter into this market. We began by saying, perhaps, first of all, we should just try to make this molecule here, hydroxymethyl furfuryl. These uh, furfuryl compounds are actually very toxic in uh, many environments, and they're very toxic to, to cells. And uh, those of you involved, of course, in ethanol and other types of biorefinery operations know well about this kind of molecule. But our interest was to try to come from glucose directly, and to say, if we build an economy on sugar, can we take glucose, use glucose as summaries? This is an enzyme which Novozymes have used, and they're, they're very expert with over many years. So we take this enzyme, and we convert it to fructose, and then we carry out the dehydration to HMF, and eventually an oxidation at the end. This has been a very interesting process. We have now started to come with a patent for this, and I can tell you that it's one of the really big challenges is how to match the different parts of this, of this uh, process. It's not easy to do, because the conditions required for the dehydration step are very different from the conditions for the biocatalytic enzymatic step in the first place. But the rationale with biorefineries is for the biocatalytic part of the process still is based on selectivity, but also we could say better use of energy and less waste as well. These are also important issues in here. We believe we need to ultimately move towards a dedicated uh, kind of plant, and we look at a number of issues about trying to model this. Huge improvements in productivity are required. This kind of process can only work at something like uh, 10 tons per kilogram of a mobilized enzyme, 10 tons of product per kilogram of a mobilized enzyme, and about 300 to 400 grams per liter concentration. So this will give you an idea of where we need to get to. The water use in this kind of process is also a problem. We use quite a lot of water here, and we need to optimize the amount of water. Pinch technology is one of the tools we have available to do that. Downstream processing is a major challenge as well. The molecules are very similar to each other. And we need to have complete integration. That's the most important issue here, how to integrate the whole thing together. Also, the supply of the glucose and the purity of the glucose in the first place in relation to the final product. And as I said here, that is how competitive advantage is actually won. That's how one company will beat another company by being able to solve that kind of a problem. Okay, second example I want to talk about is a completely different area. This is a process that we worked on with Glaxo Klein for quite some years and started to implement this process. This concerns the synthesis of this compound here. It's commonly known as sciatic acid, neuraminic acid. Uh, this is a, a compound that's extremely difficult to, to uh, make, and uh, it's extracted for many years. It was extracted, uh, the Chinese actually have used this for many years in medicine, and they extract it from the saliva in bird's nests. Of course, that's, that's not really a very practical type of process, as you understand. We have to make much more product than we can extract from the saliva in bird's nests. 
In order to do that, we discover there's an enzyme which actually breaks down this uh, neuraminic acid to monosamine and uh, pyruvate. But of course, we want to run the reaction the other way. This is exactly what I mentioned earlier about now having to shift the thermodynamics. How do we do that? How do we push the reaction uphill? And one of the ways we can uh, start to do that, of course, is by using an excess of one or other of the reactants. So if I try to use an excess of either pyruvate or monosamine, one of the things I have to understand is what happens to the enzyme activity when I operate with an excess of one of these components. So here I plot out the enzyme activity as a function of pyruvate concentration and monosamine concentration. See here we talk about three molar pyruvate, one and a half molar of uh, monosamine to give you an idea of the type of concentration range that we're interested in. This kind of uh, experiments can be done very quickly in a 96 well plate, so that very quickly we can obtain this kind of data. And then we can say, to be productive, we need to get a certain level of enzyme activity. The uh, lawyers at GlaxoSmithKline asked me to take the units off here, so it just says enzyme activity. But if we assume that we need a certain level of enzyme activity, then I can make what I call a window from this, where I take this 3D plot with one variable and it's another variable, and the different the desired property here, I say I need a value above this line here, and if I turn this now on top, so that I look from above, then I plot one variable against the other, to the right of this line here, I can operate my process effectively. This kind of operating window is a very useful way of looking at different processes. So if we look now, for example, at the, at the neuromic acid process, now I plot the monosamine concentration against the pyruvate concentration. To the right of this line here, I have too low a level of enzyme activity. But the real advantage of using a window of this kind of, of approach is that I'm also able to plot on here, the region here where I have things like low solubility for monosamine here, low product concentration. To the right of this line here, the downstream processing, one of the ways you're doing this is with ion exchange chromatography, that's very difficult to achieve. So this sets for me a region where I can operate my, my process inside here. I can change, if I want, the variables here. Now I need to operate to the right of this line here. If I want a certain yield of, of uh, neuraminic acid on the monosin. Very powerful technique. We actually have some software which also helps us to do that. So here I, I show monosamine against pyruvate. I'm sorry about the colours here. I think my, my poster is completely colourblind or something. It's really horrible, especially this time of the morning. But anyway, uh, so you can see here, that this, this is the window part here. And we can set different constraints or different values here as well. So now I can change those values, and you see this area of the window will be changed. Okay, now I get bigger still, and bigger still. That's very useful to help us to control the process, to understand what we need to do to be able to control the process. So this also helps with evaluation of effects for changing process variables, alternative processes, time-dependent effects, scale-dependent effects, changes to the biocatalyst, and very recently, we've been looking at multi-enzymatic processes where we, each enzyme has its own characteristic window. How do you now put one of these on top of another? What's the possibility to bring them together to make uh, a one-pot uh, operation? And uh, now we've started to develop some more user-friendly software, hopefully with better color as well. Okay, third example I want to talk about uh, is also in the pharmaceutical industry. This is a, a process which we developed with a company in Switzerland. That company is not Lonza, by the way. But a company in uh, Switzerland where we started to consider if we could make this kind of lactone, this kind of optically pure lactone. And uh, there are some... Uh, this, this type of reaction, I should say, is a very well-known chemical reaction. But to do it selectively is actually quite difficult. So although this reaction is well over 100 years old, by the chemist. To be able to do it selectively, we need some enzymes to do that, and we found an enzyme uh, some years ago, we found an enzyme which enables us to be able to take this kind of cyclic ketone here, and to insert an oxygen in here to be able to make these kind of uh, lactate. This is a very valuable reaction from the pharmaceutical uh, perspective. 
And it's not an easy reaction to carry out. Exactly as Andres mentioned yesterday, many of these enzymes, these most useful enzymes, so this is a cyclohexanone monooxygenase, these kind of enzymes, they require, unfortunately, we have some cofactor, this NADPH here, this is the most expensive of these nicotinamide cofactors, and we need to have some recycle methods for this. So the way we normally do that is inside the cell, and in this case, we clone and put everything into E. coli to be able to run the reaction. We also have to do that because where we found the enzyme originally is in a pathogenic strain. So we have to take it from that and put it into E. coli to operate this reaction effectively. This reaction also requires molecular oxygen. Half a mole here comes into the molecule here, as you can see. So this kind of reaction is very interesting to try to look at. And together with this company in Switzerland, we started to scale this up. And one of the early questions that we asked ourselves was, how should we run the process? Okay, of course, there are many chemical and biological questions, but how should we actually run this process? For example, should we have the fermentation and biocatalysis together, and then we purify the product? Should we try to separate the fermentation and the biocatalytic step? If it's not growth associated, the product formation, maybe we could separate the two. In fact, if we separate the two, maybe we can even go as far as what I call here biocatalyst preparation. And in the event, that's ter that turned out to be very useful, where we're now able to take the, the, uh, the, the stream which comes from the fermentation, centrifuge it, resuspend this in water. By resuspending in water, we now have a much easier downstream uh, purification here. And we're also able to change the concentration here so we get exactly the right concentration coming into the biocatalytic step. So we're able to optimize each of these steps. We apply exactly the same type of thinking now to other types of enzyme, including uh, P450 uh, monooxygenase. Let's go back again to the drivers for the process. Catalyst production, the number of grams of product per gram of catalyst. The conversion, the gram per liter per hour, space time meal, and a product concentration, the, the concentration of product coming into the downstream uh, process. And using those kind of metrics, we can plot those metrics, the gram per gram, the gram per liter per hour, and gram per liter as a function of the biocatalyst concentration. This is what we call regime mapping, and this is extremely useful type of analysis, just like the process window, this is also a very useful way of looking at the process. It tells us, for example, against here by a catalyst concentration, where the process is stability limited, stability in terms of the product, uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the biocatalyst, where we're product limited, what concentration we have here, and also where we're rate limited. And it also tells us the, the, the concentration of biocatalyst where that will change. So here we know, at this point here, we shift from stability limited to product limited. Here we shift from product limited to rate limited. This not only tells us the strategy we should use to improve the process, but it also tells us the region that we're likely to be in. Of course, also we get some other information in this plot. We also get information, for example, about the, the values, the metrics here, about whether we can really make this process or not. In the end, when we implement this process, it comes in a form which looks like this, with a, an agitated tank, a recycled loop here where we have both substrate, which is released to the reactor, and also we absorb product uh, as well. We have to do some complicated things like exchanging some biocatalysts as we go along to the process also. But that kind of uh, implementation enables us then to get productivity targets which are looking more reasonable. This is here grams of product per gram of biomass. By that I mean how much biocatalyst we have, whole cell biocatalyst we have. So we're not talking now about a mobilized enzyme, and therefore the values here are a little bit different. So here if we can get somewhere between 10 and 15, this will be adequate. And here, these are the kind of concentrations we require for this type of very high value product. What's interesting from this plot, we, we mapped out on here where we started, and where we end in the process. And what's interesting is you can see that it's a combination of techniques which get us to the final answer. That's a very important message, that if you combine the technologies together, 
we can get synergistic effects which are much more powerful than we were otherwise able uh, to achieve. And that's very useful for me to start to talk about the last example, and that concerns a very interesting type of reaction. Again, Andres mentioned this yesterday, but this is a reaction where we talk about using an amino transferase, or transaminase, omega transaminase, where we convert uh, here and we, we add in this kind of amino uh, uh, amine uh, functionality into otherwise a keto molecule. 40% of all the pharmaceuticals which are made contain this kind of, 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 of chiral amine. So this is so important to try to do this reaction effectively. There are something like six ways to get to these kind of molecules, and one of the interesting ways is to use this kind of uh, transaminase technology. And the biggest problem with this is that when you sit down and you do your evaluation of the cost of the reactor, the cost of the product, and the yield that we have on this reaction, we see we can't make any money. And the reason we can't make any money from this is not that the chemistry is not good, it is that the equilibrium is very unfavorable. We can't run this reaction any other way because we have to make an optically pure molecule, we have to make a chiral center. So somehow we have to think about driving the equilibrium. There are three ways, of course, we can do that. We could use an excess of the, of the reactant substrate, we could remove one or maybe both of the product, or maybe we can make a combination of these kind of techniques. Let's, uh, let us just think a little bit about how that, how that could be. The first thing is that we had a look a few years ago at different types of transaminase reactions which had been published. Now that's quite instructive to do because you see the chemists, they do a fantastic job, but on the other hand, they're not getting the productivities which are required to really make a process here. And if you look here at kind of, let's set ourselves some moderate targets here. Here we need 10 grams per, per gram per catalyst. Here we need to get to maybe 50 uh, gram per liter product concentration. You will see that only a few processes really achieve this. There's a process here, this is the citagliptin process from Merck, and here's a process from Lonza. Those two processes achieve this, the other processes don't really even get near to these kind of values. So the bottlenecks in this kind of process, we don't go through this in the interest of time, but the bottlenecks here are related especially to the thermodynamics. And as I said, there's a number of approaches we can take. The first thing we could try to do, it's very easy, isn't it? We just use an excess of one of the reactants to try to drive the equilibrium here. But how much of an excess do we require? So here we plot out the excess of donor we require against the equilibrium constants. And I've plotted on here typical kinds of values for the equilibrium constants I can expect for these kind of systems. If I do that, you will see the excess I require is very huge. In order to be able to get 85% conversion, for example, here, I require a tenfold excess. That's a really big challenge, how to be able to deal with it. Another approach we can take is to remove the product as we go along. You can read many papers, also from myself, which will tell you about in-situ product removal, where we remove the product as we go along to shift the equilibrium. But actually, it's not quite so simple. Here, what I've shown is the co-product concentration, product concentration, which we need to have in solution to be able to shift a reaction with these equilibrium values to obtain this kind of yield. Now you can see that the concentrations required in solution, these values over here, are very low. Tiny, tiny concentrations. We don't even know that we have technology which is good enough to be able to get down to such a low level. So that's also quite important to see. If we combine the two things together, let's combine now a tenfold excess together with removing the product as we go along. Now you can see I get a slightly better situation for some of these reactions up here, it might be possible to run the process. But in other cases, it really won't be possible, and that's quite a challenge. This is for the start of a procedure which we're now looking at, which helps us for any of these reactions to be able to come with a complete algorithm from the reaction system all the way to be able to design the process. And for two cases now, we really started to be able to put that 
in place. Also very usefully for companies, this tells us in some cases this will never work as technology. That's a really useful thing for a company to know early on. This technology will not work, we cannot put this in place. But eventually we will come with an algorithm which helps us to be able to determine a particular equilibrium constant here. And incidentally, if you look in the literature, you will see that very often this equilibrium constant is not given and it's not written in the, in the papers. If we have this kind of value, we'll be able to determine what kind of technologies we can use to be able to solve a particular problem. And we're right in the middle of doing that now, not at the end of that uh, game. Okay, let me come with one or two concluding remarks and uh, one or two things to think about here. I'd like to talk a little bit about process design and about uh, scale-up and then also about some trends which I see going on in, in biotalysis. Let's begin with process design. 20 years ago, we used to think about the following way of designing one of these processes. We used to say, what are the reaction conditions? Maybe we even went as far as to say a little bit, these are the targets we require for the process. And then we also said, okay, what kind of biocatalyst do we have? And let's try and put these together. And then we, we try to come with a compromised process. So the process is not ideal, the biocatalyst is not ideal. That's not a very good way of putting a process together. Maybe in the pharmaceutical industry we can get away with that to some extent. But in other industries we will never get away with it. So where we are today is a different way of looking at this. Today we're now at the point we can take reaction conditions, set process targets, and we have a much better idea how to be able to do that. And then having done that we can define an ideal process. I think it's quite an interesting idea to design the process in reverse to say what kind of downstream separation do we require, and based on that, what kind of reactor do we require. And then based on that, we can go further and say what kind of biocatalyst do we require, because the techniques that we come with now with protein engineering enable us to find, search, I've written here, but to find or design exactly the right kind of biocatalyst. So that's a fantastic opportunity, the whole way of changing the, the way that we might design a process. Something else to think about is how to scale up one of these processes. Again, 20 years ago we used to say, well, we want to increase the volume of the reactor to make more product. So we used to say, okay, then how do we get to this point up here with sufficient productivity, <coughs> sufficient volume? Today we know we need to do this in two stages. First of all, we have to have a process which is, has sufficient intensity. We need to have an intensified process first, then we can look at the scale-up. The scale-up is perhaps not so hard. Trying to get the intensity of the process is the real challenge. That's what's difficult. So now we can take this in a two-part procedure here. That's also been very important to, to learn in the last years. What about trends for biotasis? Where will we go in the future compared to where we are today? Well, applications today are mostly in the pharmaceutical industry. And where we're going is actually lower value products. It is towards, of course, biofuels, bulk chemicals uh, as well, but also integration with chemical synthesis that we have today. The biocatalysts themselves, okay, they're recombinant, isolated enzymes, but we will move towards multi-enzyme systems. In 10 years' time, we will only talk about multiple enzymes working together. We won't talk about single enzymes anymore. That's the technology of the past. We will also integrate this much more with whole cell and also fermentation processes as well. Technology moves from today in mobilization to in situ product removal to liquid phase using resins as well as in mobilization as well. Process plants will perhaps move from being dedicated to much more interesting concept of retrofit and also modular and flexible processes. We had a very interesting project with AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical company, where we tried to make a completely flexible process for them. That doesn't mean we necessarily use everything or all the plants in a very effective way, but it's a very interesting way of trying to design and run the process. I think for natural products and especially for biorefineries, that can also be very interesting to get to that. Design and methodology, I talked quite a bit about that already. Process operation and control is something that will improve. 
and the reactions themselves will move from these kind of reactions which are established to a much harder group of reactions, oxidases and oxygenases in particular, where the chemistry is very fantastic, but the productivities are very fantastically low. So what we do at BTU is we work especially on trying to look at different methods of process intensification and also at speeding the development. So to come with evaluation tools, what I call process analysis, to be able to help us to design the process uh, much faster and more effectively as well. So just a final few comments, take home messages for you. Process engineering is essential for implementation of bioprocesses. I think that's very important that we all recognize that. No question that biology is important, no question that chemistry in this particular area is important, but really to fulfill everything in industrial biotechnology, we really need to have the process engineering part as well. Process engineering tools are required to evaluate new process technologies. That should be a special role that we as chemical or biochemical engineers really try to carry out. Uh, process engineering tools are also required to assist in designing the biocatalyst. Okay, that's a biologist's job. And they do a fantastic job of protein engineering and changing the amino acids. Uh, it's also very important that we can help them and give them an idea and set some targets for them about what we really need to achieve. DTU, we're building these tools by collaboration. We also have a pilot to scale bioprocess facility to test out the concepts as well. And I would say also we are really open to collaboration, to students, to faculty exchange. We think that's extremely important because that's how we are able to learn so much more about these kind of uh, processes. I'd like to thank the fantastic people that work in my team. And I would also like to thank the companies that I collaborate with. That's a very important part for us and for me as an engineer to work with these kind of companies. And I haven't listed all the companies here, but these are typical kind of collaborating companies. And working with them is extremely interesting because they set the agenda of the types of problems that we as engineers really uh, need to, to look at. And I think if we work together with them, just as much as working with, with chemists and with biologists as well, then there will be a very interesting future indeed. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I'd like to see uh, your opinion regarding the disposal of technologies in the, for the future. I, I came from an equipment uh, uh, company, not, not from Academy, and uh, we are being asked each more times to, to develop disposal of equipment. So I'd like to know that. Thank you for the question, because it's an extremely interesting issue. Um, I've been involved with a company recently where we started to say, how can we reduce the capital? cost of their process. And uh, the discussion has gone along the lines that, well, we could implement a biocatalytic process. But if we put a biocatalytic process in place, there are some problems, it's new technology, and this takes some time for the company, and they have to try to implement this, they maybe don't have enough experience. On the other hand, their biggest problem is not operating costs, but capital costs. And then they got the idea, okay, if we can operate at mild conditions, and in water, but we don't need to have such fantastic capital expenditure and to make uh, huge tanks of uh, steel and so on. Instead, we could try to operate in polypropylene plants. So that's actually a huge trend, I think, that we will see happening, that people will operate on much simpler plant. And it's one of the things that biocatalysis actually can offer to us. The questions, of course, to be raised a little bit are about economies of scale and the right kind of size for this, how also we can link together the different pieces of equipment. But I really think that can become a very important trend for the future to try to operate in that kind of way. It's a little bit different to the biopharmaceutical industry and what uh, Mohammed was talking about yesterday. That's when we really talk about a plastic bag inside a tank. That's a different kind of situation. Here I think we could really talk about making uh, yeah, whole plants of uh, polypropylene because the conditions are so favourable and we don't need high pressures and so on. So I think it can be a fantastic opportunity. Uh, thank you, Joe, for this fantastic and enlightening presentation. I really loved it. Uh, my question is a very uh, practical question. Uh, 
the beginning of your talk, you were speaking about infant costs. Uh, this is a rather elusive concept. When, when we work at laboratory scale, we get infant for free because infant producer, so we say, they look with sympathy the effort you're doing to do their answer. Yeah. But as long as you are going into real business, what's the price of it? This is a kind of agreement with that the producer and the user. Yeah. What's your comment about that? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I mean, thanks for the question because it's a very important issue, and I think people are very worried about enzyme cost. Uh, the key thing is how, how we use the enzyme in an effective way, like I said, so how many grams we get per gram. That's, that's the important figure to always keep in mind. Of course, the actual cost is by negotiation. That is correct. And if we talk about a bigger industry, so where no enzymes work, let's say, in a biofuel, then, uh, of course, then they can really take advantage of the economies of scale, very good expression systems. They spend a lot of time working on that to get those costs down. When we talk about an enzyme, let's just take uh, transaminase as an example. Here we have uh, two very small companies that work on, on this. Um, okay, there's another company in the United States, Codexis, that also works on it. And they, their business model is that they have to charge a lot to really be able to, to work effectively. So this comes down to the type of business model that different companies will use here, I think. What I see is huge development, though, in two things. One is people's awareness of the use things make of the enzyme. So that's that's very important. If you make very effective use of the enzyme, if the enzyme is very stable, if it's immobilized so we can recycle it, these have huge benefits. And that's important to, to bear in mind. But the other thing is that I think that there are many new companies coming forward now. I think there are over five or six companies in Germany alone where they now really try to come with uh, completely uh, complete uh, possibilities for making very small volume of, of enzymes. And that's a completely different business model to Novozymes. I mean, for well over 20 years, I've been banging on the door of Novozymes saying, please, would you make these type of enzymes? But their business model will never sustain that. They're a fantastic company, they do great things, but there's no way their business model can sustain that. So you need to have a completely different way of looking at the business to be able to come with the enzyme which is in the right kind of uh, cost range as well. And that, I think, has also been a fundamental problem to move biovitalysis into what could be a fantastic future in the more intermediate value of products. You see today many companies, uh, vegetable oil type companies, interested in processing, it could be a soybean oil, it could be palm oil, other types of things, but even down to waste oils and fats. Um, and there's a huge business in this where, again, if they could just get the enzyme cost in the right region and the use of the enzyme effectively, there are fantastic opportunities there which far outweigh what has been possible in pharmaceuticals so far. So the right kind of business model, I think, is very important in this, actually, to be able to implement it effectively. You see some companies like DSM uh, is an interesting example in the Netherlands where they decide they will make the enzyme themselves. They integrate the whole thing and take it all together. That, of course, can be another, another route to go, but that's not possible for every company. And for many chemical companies, or these vegetable oil-type companies, there's no way they can get into that kind of uh, technology. It's too difficult for them. Well, I thank you too for the uh, excellent uh, simulated presentation. Uh, John, uh, I have the same, the same trend that uh, we were just talking about maybe. Uh, we have been working with uh, the medical effects for a long time, trying to implement that in the industrial environment and all sorts of problems. And I really, uh, I think that the bottleneck uh, is uh, enzyme production, enzyme cost, mostly if uh, you are going to probably engineering more costly enzymes. Uh, from, uh, I'd like to uh, know uh, from you if, uh, how do you, do you see uh, the development of tools that would do some kind of uh, superstructural optimization where you integrate the enzyme production with your process and so you can somehow show someone that it's interested to produce the enzyme and then with that specific solution among a space of possible solutions we will have at the end, 
the draftable uh, process. Yeah, I think it's an excellent idea, and superstructure optimization is something we actually have looked at for some biorefinery cases also, in order to look at all the options that are possible. I think with the, when we talk about enzyme catalysis, of course the problem is that maybe the companies that can really take the best advantage of these are the companies that are not the best to be able to make the enzyme. And the question is really how to bring those two, so those two groups together. It's like trying to make any uh, product. If, it's, if the margins are too tight, you really have to come with a much more, uh, yeah, a much more integrated structure to be able to uh, do that. But I think we, we see developments also in that direction. DSM, I just mentioned, but BASF, BASF in Germany is another example of a company where they now make the enzymes themselves. And that's the route that they're going to go. And that will bring their costs into a reasonable uh, level. I should say also that I don't believe that uh, companies like uh, Novozymes uh, and some of these other smaller enzyme companies are actually making a fantastic amount of money. I don't think it's such a great business. And, uh, you know, they, they are doing their very best with fantastic expression systems and so on. But in the end, to really make the money of this, you have to integrate it together with the, with the manufacturer of the product. And there are plenty of cases in the last hundred years we can look at for other types of chemical products where the integration of everything back with the feedstock was very important. If we take the argument still further for biofinance, we can say that trying to collect the sugar or building a sugar-based economy, just as you may do here in Brazil and lead the world with that, you have to integrate that all the way back to the very first questions. We, we know, for example, when we make uh, hydroxymethyl furfuryl, the purity of the sugar is absolutely essential. So it's not just so easy to say, okay, I just take sugar and run all the way to my final product. It's a similar kind of issue that you really need to integrate all of the stages the whole way through. But I think in, a, in the new world that we could talk about, maybe in 10, 15 years' time, and the way that Brazil would certainly look at this, could be the possibility that now we can have a new type of chemical company the chemical company that makes the enzymes also is also integrated into the harvesting and collection of the biomass in the first place in order to make the sugar as well. So I think that's where we need to get to, but it needs new business leaders and new people to really think about how to get to that also. Thank you, Professor. It was a wonderful presentation. I was very amused. Um, but in the beginning of your uh, presentation, you said uh, chemical engineering don't design plans. So I'm kind of disappointed in that sense. I was also very disappointed. So would you like to share, like, yeah. what would you say, like, then who, who does design plans? It is a chemical engineer who does the process design, the economics, and... Of course the chemical engineers design the, the, the parts. It was just, I think when I started working in industry, my shock was, okay, I thought we could build a distillation car on our side, we could design a reactor and all of this, and then that would be the job, you know, week by week. Perhaps I've been misled by my professors, but uh, it's, it's not being really like that, of course. I mean, it's very important to, to uh, that, we, that we need to design processes. We need to retrofit processes. Uh, we all the time need to be supporting the production people and trying to get improvements to the process. So I think that uh, chemical engineering is a fantastically exciting area, but I can see that a lot of it is not about designing new plant. And that's because a lot of plant today, the costs are already written off. If we look in the future, we will have a huge expansion in the chemical industry, especially in Asia, but also in South America as well. And if you look at the figures for what is predicted, of course we will come with, with new plots. That is, that is correct. But it's not every, every chemical engineer's job to be designing a new plot. There can also be fantastic opportunities, just as the question I have over here, uh, some fantastic opportunities for coming with new plant concepts as well. In another project, which I have not had time to talk about, we work on miniaturization of process plants, um, operating with uh, flow systems at very small scale. That's also a fantastic opportunity for chemical engineers to be involved in uh, design. So I think for me, anyway, it was just a different type of design is what I, is what I learned about. You talked about costs, and also you talked about uh, recycling. The yeah. Yeah. 
I, I'd like to know your opinion about the possibility of recycling the enzymes for biofuels production because they always we hear about this uh, all the time that one of these arguments for the limitations of cellulose ethanol production is the enzyme cost. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's take that in two separate parts. So we, we first of all think about um, biodiesel. Okay, biodiesel is a, is a process where you need to have quite some uh, recycling of the, of the enzyme, enzymatic biodiesel. If we use a lipase there, we may require, I don't know, uh, to get at least uh, five to 8,000 kilograms per, <coughs> per kilogram of immobilized enzyme that we put inside. So we need to have recycles, maybe 200 to 250 recycles to be effective and we can use a filter to be able to one of these Johnson screens to be able to do that effectively. Um, for the future I think that actually we will not immobilize the enzyme, we will probably use a liquid enzyme and we will even try to operate with a liquid enzyme such that we can operate maybe with one one cycle, one use, or maybe with two uses recycling in the glycerol itself. I will talk a little bit about this in Cinefam because is a very important issue to implementing enzymatic biodiesel, which, by the way, can be a fantastic opportunity here in, in, uh, in Brazil. If we come to the ethanol as a second uh, kind of case, the problem, of course, with an immobilized enzyme is that we deal with material which will not go into the immobilized enzyme. So there could be other opportunities. Uh, the group in China came with a patent, which I think is very, very interesting, where they take uh, enzyme and they immobilize the enzyme which comes out of the reactor and use that to recycle it and then come, it comes back off the support again back into solution. That's a very, very interesting concept. If you could do that three times, let's say, you will probably pay for the technology and beyond three times, you will really make a big difference to the cost of the enzyme which is required in the pretreatment. So I think uh, there can be quite some opportunities there if we think in an inventive uh, Wait, I was very interested to see this pattern. It's, yeah, it's quite interesting. The, the last one. Yeah. Uh, can you comment, John, on the perspective of enzyme reactivation? When you work with an immobilized enzyme, you can develop some strategies to recover the lost activity. We've been working on that for some time. Well, yeah. What's the perspective in terms of process? Uh, yeah, I, I think that can be extremely interesting to get to that. Of course, the, the problem a little bit is about that, again, it comes down to the cost, the cost of the reagents and the cost of actually having to do this uh, reactivation. Where we would like to get to still is to have a liquid enzyme that we can use just in a single use. And just to put that into perspective a bit, if I take a, a process like glucose isomerase, the way that works to get all of the enzyme out, as, as, as you know as well as I do, is that they have a kind of profile of temperature through the reaction. So they increase the temperature as they go along to get everything they can out of the enzyme. I think that might be perhaps a more effective strategy to use. Um, we could also say, let's say, the biodiesel case. We can have our enzyme there and we can, in the most effective way, try to get, get to the end of this reaction so I don't have 50% less left or 40% of the enzyme activity left. I've really taken all of it because that's what I also need to do to get to a cost-effective uh, process. But I think there can be very interesting techniques, and for sure, in specific cases, no doubt, it will be very useful. One further comment. When, when the cost of inactivation is thermal inactivation, it's much more complicated to reactivate. Yes, yes. But when you're working in organic cultures, for instance, it can be rather easy to recover the enzyme after yes. the enzyme has lost the activity. So I think it's very much dependent on it's the It's very process. much dependent on the case, I agree completely.